We are in Deuteronomy tonight, Deuteronomy chapter 21, and uh, everything is working for once. I, after our little experience on Sunday afternoon, I have a backup on my phone for this, so, um, but it's working on my iPad, so that's good. So Deuteronomy 21. Now this chapter has two seemingly unrelated sections. Uh, but there is one key idea that brings them together. The two sections are uh, expiation of a crime, the first nine verses, and then domestic relations. Those are the headers that are uh, in my New American Standard. That's how they divide this up. Uh, and those are obviously not inspired. But there is, a, there is a clear division between these two sections. So I'm going to read the first section, <clears throat> verses 1 through 9. Then we'll talk a little bit about that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on details here. I think most of it is fairly straightforward, and uh, we will. Uh, but what I want to get to, I've got a lot of things in the notes, so I want to get to the thing that unifies everything in this chapter. So, <clears throat> verse 1, If a slain person is found lying in the open country, in the land which the Lord your God gives you to possess, and it is not known who has struck him, then your elders and your judges shall go out and measure the distance to the cities which are around the slain one. It shall be that the city which is nearest to the slain man, that is, the elders of that city, shall take a heifer of the herd, which has not been worked and which is not pulled in a yoke, and the elders of that city shall bring the heifer down to a valley with running water, which has not been plowed or sown, and shall break the heifer's neck there in the valley." Then the priests, the sons of Levi, shall come near, for the Lord your God has chosen them to serve him and to bless in the name of the Lord, and every dispute and every assault shall be settled by them. All the elders of that city which is nearest to the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the valley. And they shall answer and say, Our hands did not shed this blood, nor did our eyes see it. Forgive your people, Israel, whom you have redeemed, O Lord, and do not place the guilt of innocent blood in the midst of your people Israel, and the blood guiltiness shall be forgiven them. So you shall remove the guilt of innocent blood from your midst, and when you do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. So this is uh, uh, an interesting section. I have a, a, a summary statement that comes at the beginning of this section in Eugene Merrill's commentary. He says, laws pertaining to homicide up to this point have involved the presence of witnesses. Commonly, however, corpses are discovered bearing evidence of foul play, but with no witnesses to the act or none willing to testify. How could such dilemmas be resolved in Israel in such a way as to exculpate the community, which otherwise must bear corporate responsibility and guilt? The answer lay in a ritual, the details of which comprise the present section. So he's just describing what is going to happen there. Now there's a key word in verse 1. It says, if a slain person. Now the word there, slain, is literally one who is pierced with a sword. So this is not somebody who's died of natural causes. He has an obvious wound. He didn't get that while just, you know, walking along and something, should, somehow he suddenly burst open and there's this, you know, whoa, that's not going to be the way it works. He's obviously been murdered. But nobody knows how this happened. Who did it? Whatever. So that's the idea. Then the second thing that is, you have, want to note, uh, let's see, in the open country, in the land. Now that's a, a term, <clears throat> this is Haaretz, this is the term for Israel. This is the term for the promised land. And it, um, uh, again, I think this is Merrill again, he says, it, uh, it became a sin against the Lord as well as against the victim for it had taken place on the Lord's own estate, on, on the common ground. So it's, it's, like it, it's like God himself has been offended. I mean, obviously God is offended whenever there's a murder, but a murder done in secret, it sort of pollutes the ground, is the idea. It pollutes the land of Israel. That's an important point to keep in mind as we think about this whole section. And so there's this ritual that follows uh, the elders of the nearest town, offer a non-bloody sacrifice. There are certain things about uh, the, the, the heifer can't be one that has ever been put to work, can't have borne a yoke. They have to go to a, a stream of running water. They break the neck of the heifer. They kill it by that, but not by slitting its throat. 
So it's not a sacrifice in the same way that the um, uh, that a you know normally they would take an offering to the altar at the place of God's choosing. They'd offer a sacrifice of a burnt offering. It's it is a sacrifice, but it's a non-bloody sacrifice. It's part of the uh, a different kind of ritual here. And then there's the washing of hands and so forth, and a prayer of expiation where the town elders make a commitment to the Lord. This is not something that we know about. We don't know how this happened, uh, but we are offering this offering to you, Lord, to uh, wash our town and our community of any connection with the guilt of this death. And the purpose is stated in verse 8, do not place the guilt of innocent blood in the midst of your people Israel. So again, the idea of the land being polluted and then this prayer asking God not to attach any guilt to them. Now there are curious things in here that uh, you know the commentaries will talk about, and uh, you know uh, some of them are you know it's not exa- absolutely clear what every detail means. You may have some questions about some of the things that are mentioned in this section, but I won't have any answers for you because I am as much in dark as as perhaps anybody else is. It, there's some things that we read in the scriptures like this that, you know, there's tantalizing little bits. You say, well, why did he say it that way? Well, commentaries have guesses, but uh, sometimes that's all they are. All right, so then the next one is called domestic relations. As you work your way all the way to the end, it sounds that he sort of leaves domestic relations, but that's what we're going to le- use as the header because that's what the uh, text or what our... our uh, at least the New American says, and it seems a convenient way to break it down. Now, I'm going to read, there's two sections on laws concerning wives. I'll read that, and uh, you just follow along. When you go out, this is verse 10, when you go out to battle against your enemies, and the Lord your God delivers them into your hands, and you take them away captive, and see among the captives a beautiful woman, and have a desire for her, and would take her as a wife for yourself. Then you shall bring her home to your house, and she shall shave her head, and trim her nails. She shall also remove the clothes of her captivity, and she shall remain in your house and mourn her mother, father and mother a full month, and after that you may go into her and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. It shall be, if you are not pleased with her, then you shall let her go wherever she wishes, but you shall certainly not sell her for money. You shall not mistreat her, because you have humbled her. That's the first section. We'll come back and talk a little bit about this in a minute. If a man has two wives, the one loved and the other unloved, and both the loved and the unloved have borne him sons, if the firstborn son belongs to the unloved, then it shall be in the day he wills what he has to his sons. He cannot make the son of the loved the firstborn before the son of the unloved, who is the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the beginning of his strength, To him belongs the right of the firstborn. So that's the second law concerning marriage in this section. It has to do with the situation that happens with uh, polygamous marriages. And I know, uh, I'll just pause here for a moment. I had a roommate who was uh, from the Gambia. He was uh, the little country in Africa that follows the Gambia River. And it's surrounded by Senegal on on the outsides of it. It's a little independent country. He came from there. <clears throat> he was raised in a Muslim home. He, his father and mother, he only had, uh, his father only had one wife, his mother. But his father had died fairly young, and so possibly he could have taken other wives. But he told me that his uncle, who uh, was a Muslim, uh, had many wives. He had many cousins. And he said that home was full of constant strife and bickering as the, as the sons of the various wives and daughters, I suppose, too, would play up to the dad and try to get him to play favorites and trying to, you know, all looking for them the biggest chunk of the inheritance. And he talked about the chaos that came about in those, that family and many other families like that because of that kind of a relationship. So God is putting a regulation on this. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment. I'm just explaining what this is all about. All right, so let's read the next section, and we'll read right through it. We'll get to the end of the chapter, and then a few comments to follow after that. Beginning in verse 18. If any man has a stubborn and rebellious son 
who will not obey his father or his mother, and when, when they chastise him, he will not even listen to them. Then his father and mother shall seize him and bring him out to the elders of the city at the gateway of his hometown. They shall say to the elders of his city, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all of the men of his city shall stone him to death. So you shall remove the evil from your midst, and all Israel will hear of it and fear. If a man has committed a sin worthy of death, and he is put to death... Oh, so I'm, let me pause there, just a second. That, that verse 21 ends with the stoning of the son. Now that is a very big one. We'll get to, I have lots of notes on that one. We'll talk about that a little bit more also. Then the last two verses. If a man has committed a sin worthy of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree... His corpse shall not hang all night on the tree, but you shall surely bury him on the same day. For he who is hanged is a curse of God, so that you do not defile your land, which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. Now this particular verse is important with respect to the gospel because uh, there was the need to put the executed criminals into the grave before the Sabbath, at least according to the criminals. I use the word criminals loosely, but it had to do with the two thieves who were crucified with the Lord and with the Lord himself for not to leave an executed man on the cross overnight. And the Sabbath was approaching. And so there was a rush to remove them from the cross. And you'll recall how that story went. That refers back to this passage in Deuteronomy. All right, so now a few comments. We'll comment first about, uh, <clears throat> about the, what, the marriage laws here. Now, the first section where it talks about the foreign wife does not imply polygamy. It simply involves marrying foreign wives and regulating, regulating what might happen if the man decided to divorce his foreign wife. He wasn't, the thing that in particular was regulated was that normally what would happen if you take people captive, and this happened all over the ancient world, you take people captive they would be sold in slave markets. They would become slaves to someone. But some guy sees amongst those captives a woman that he thinks, well, she might make a good wife for me. And uh, he decides to take her as his wife. And there's a procedure they rem the, uh, where it talks about her, uh, does it say shave her head? I can't remember. Okay, shave her head, cut her nails, take off, uh, take off the clothes of her captivity. She presumably wouldn't go around for a month without any clothes, but then with Israelite clothes. And the idea is that she is basically putting her past in her past. So she is renouncing, symbolically, her uh, pagan uh, background, and she is becoming a woman of Israel, in other words. Well, if the man decides, she's no good, I don't want her, he could, allow, he could uh, send her away, but he could not sell her as a slave. She is no longer the status of a captive. So it's protecting her rights is what this law is all about. Now there are certain things about this. We look at it now in the 21st century. We say this is a little bizarre. But in terms of the, uh, in terms of the social structure of the ancient world, what God is doing is protecting the rights of people who are put in vulnerable situations. He is not approving He's not saying one thing or another about whether or not a man should do this thing. He is simply saying, if you do this, you, are, you are, cannot use this woman and then, then sell her off as a slave. That would be, it's like, you, you, have, you, have no, you, you lose the right to do that, to profit off her as a captor. You must treat her as a woman, as a dignified, you know, give her some dignity. All right, so that's what that's about. All right, the second section deals with the inheritance, as I mentioned. And it should be stressed that both situations are regulated, not approved. I have this comment from Merrill, and I find him, he's a very wise commentator. I, uh, if you ever see a commentary by Eugene Merrill, it, it's usually quite good. He's uh, an Old Testament scholar. And he's uh, got lots of good things to say, so he's a good name to note in our notes. I put footnotes for you. But anyway, so uh, it must be stressed, he says, that the allowance of divorce uh, is not a blanket endorsement of it. This and other references to such termination of marriages in the Old Testament 
must be balanced against others that either show it in a negative light or bar it altogether. So he gives a whole list of passages there. In the pristine days of Israel's election to be a covenant people, the Lord toler tolerated many of their sub-biblical ways, slowly but surely educating them to the moral perfections that he gradually revealed to them. Forbearance toward improper behavior and the affirmative of it are altogether different responses. And we could say that about the regulations, uh, even uh, the, where he, he, is, he is stating a condition, and we know through Israel's history, even starting with <coughs> Abraham and uh, uh, Jacob had multiple wives. Abraham had uh, several wives, not all at the same time, but he took a concubine uh, while Sarah was living at her suggestion. So all of these things, we think, how in the world can this be allowed? How can God, we look at what the Bible and the church has taught for all these years and think, this is just, this seems so bizarre. But we have to remember that none of these people in the Old Testament had any Bible up until Moses. Abraham didn't have a Bible. All he had were a few stories that were handed down from any forefathers that followed God. He didn't have a Bible. The first five books of the Bible are written by Moses. Uh, now God is coming, bringing his revelation into the world when people, they've just been sort of trying to figure things out. They knew they had to acknowledge God. They had some tradition of that. They had an idea of sacrifice. And, uh, and they had some of them, Abraham and his family, had a relationship with the true God. And they didn't follow idolatry. And they focused on following the true God. But they had not received very much revelation. So this is why I think uh, Merrill's term here, sub-biblical. Obviously, it's, as, as revelation progresses, we realize that God's will is not for multiple uh, wives. And we realize that God's will is not for divorce. And we find many passages that speak out against it. And so on and so forth. So, so we are looking back at that ancient history from the benefit of having the whole Bible. They, up until Moses, they didn't have any Bible. And even after Moses, all they had are the first five books for many years. So we have to, we have to be, I think, uh, a little bit, um, how shall we put it, understanding of their situation. Uh, perhaps I would say, if you look at the experience that my friend talked about in the Gambia with, in observing his uncle's family, the chaos that comes into a home where there's multiple wives and multiple children and people competing for inheritances and trying to rat out their brother and sister so that, so that you know they're no longer the favorite, that would be pretty bad. Natural observation should be able to tell you this can't be God's way. Right? It's something that, sh that should be obvious just by the way things work out. You look at the chaos that happened in David's family with the very many different sons he had. And, and surely you'd think Solomon would look at that and say, you know, he's supposed to, you know, Solomon was wise in some ways, but he wasn't wise in that way, was he? And so uh, it shows uh, what man is like, shows the mistakes that men make, shows the unwisdom of some of the, their actions. That over time, these things are revealed more clearly to us. And that's, that's really, uh, to me, it sounds sort of like a cop-out, but in a way, to me, if, if I think about the fact that they did not have a Bible, that God is now putting some regulations on existent situations so that they uh, can establish peace on these matters and they can treat people properly in these existing situations, then uh, to me that's the best we can do with some of these Old Testament regulations. All right, so let's move to the rebellious son. I want to talk about that one. I have now. I uh, there are four charges. If you look at uh, verse eighteen and verse twenty, verse eighteen talks about a stubborn and rebellious son. All right, and then verse twenty, they come bring the child or the young man. This isn't just a little boy. This is a, at least a teenager. Uh, he's still in under the parents' roof. He's under their control. This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. You say, wow, 
You know, and so they deliver him over to the elders of the city to be stoned to death. This does seem quite extreme, right, doesn't it? I mean, you read that and you say, this is one of those passages in the Old Testament that troubles me. And I have a little note in my Bible program. I found an article on this a couple of years ago that really uh, enlightens our understanding. This comes from the Biblical Archaeological Review. Uh, Biblical Archaeological Review, or BAR as it's called, is not a, it is a liberal Christian organization. Okay, they are not, they are not conservative by any stretch. These people, I, I subscribe to the magazine because it has good archaeological information, but I do not agree with most of their biblical teaching. But in this particular article, archaeology has enlightened what this is referring to. I believe. I think this is a very good point. So I'm I'm got four uh, basically paragraphs I've I've copied out of here to uh, uh, to to give you the idea of what this is all about. So the first one, this English rendering of a glutton and a drunkard, has largely been assumed without investigating the food and drink consumed by the rebellious son in the text particular cultural context. The severe punishment appears to those of us in the modern West to be at odds with the alleged crime. What did the rebellious son do that was so threatening to the community that stoning was required? So that's the question. Like, really, he's, I mean, he just overeats and he gets drunk? Is that, is that the issue? Okay, so um, now I'm skipping out. There's a whole lot in this article, and it's, uh, it is a, a little bit technical, uh, but uh, I'm skipping out certain parts of it. Since nothing suggests that consuming large quantities of food or drink per se has been seen as detestable or deserving death in ancient Israel, the crime of the rebellious son in Deuteronomy 21, 18 to 21 could not be gluttony and drunkenness as we know them today. To understand what he did wrong, we must look at the context in which food was eaten and the socio-religious customs associated with food and drink. All right, so that's a big word. Okay, the social and religious customs. That's what that means, all right? So being a being a archaeological review, even their title is full of long words. So, so you're, you're going to find long words in what they write. Okay, laws such as the centralization of sacrifice in Deuteronomy 12, that's where, if you remember, back in Deuteronomy 12, he, Moses is instructing them, you're going to bring the place of worship to the place that God chooses. You're not going to be out just as families, the father, the priest in the home, leading the worship in the home, as you have been doing in the wilderness. That's not the way it's going to work. We're going to come together, and the worship will be conducted by the priests in the place that God chooses, Rome, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 12. And then the law of the rebellious son in Deuteronomy 21, were likely created in response to the widespread sacrifices to other deities across the land. Now, <clears throat> let me just read the last paragraph and I'll give some more explanations. The Hebrew word commonly translated as glutton in this passage is difficult to render in a way that conveys its socio-religious meaning as there is no real equivalent in English. This is also the case for the word uh, sobe, uh, which is frequently translated as drunkard. Perhaps a better translation of this passage would be, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a deviant eater and a deviant drinker. Okay? This translation would place the rebellious son's actions in the clearer context of non-Yahwistic, that's Jehovah or Yahweh, worship, Specifically, the accepted food ways, a crime that is repeatedly proscribed in the Bible and carries the penalty of death. Now, what she's saying, and in the article, it's a much longer article than this. I've just given you these, these few snippets. But what she's saying is that archaeological evidence has shown that there were certain kinds of eating that were connected with idol worship. That's why she's translating it, deviant drinking and deviant eating, right? Rather than simply gluttony and drunkard, because that, in our connotation, in the way we think of that word in English, it doesn't sound like idol worship. But there must be something 
that would bring about this kind of sin. It can't be simply that the guy eats too much and drinks too much. Okay, it has to be something else. And I think this is, uh, yeah, is as you read about the practices and uh, archaeological evidence that she's referring to, I think this is a reasonable way of looking at the passage. This is a more serious crime, in other words, this crime of the rebellious son is a more serious crime than merely just being a kid that's hard to handle, who uh, drinks too much and eats too much. Uh, we would think that that is consistent with the whole Bible. But there is something else about this, and we'll tie this in in just a moment, that will, uh, I think, help us with all this. The last thing is this treating of a do an executed body. The key idea is in verse uh, 20, uh, two, 23, Notice at the end, so that you do not defile your land. And let's notice this thread that runs through the chapter. Look back at verse 8. Forgive your people Israel, whom you have redeemed, O Lord, and do not place the guilt of innocent blood in the midst of your people Israel, and the blood guiltiness shall be forgiven them. So you shall remove the guilt of innocent blood from your midst when you do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. And then also in verse 21, that sin of the son, you shall remove the evil from your midst. So I think that all of this is connected. There, there, the, when, when God's law is violated, especially uh, in uh, these three things are mentioned, but even the violations, if you were to mistreat a woman that you've taken captive and you've said, oh, I'm going to marry her, and then you send her out, okay, you are, you, you are risking and causing an offense in the land if you, if you sell her as a slave, for example. You take away all her rights. And you've, you've already humbled her, and now you, you, you sell her as a slave. Or if you, if you are somebody who is, you, you know, you have a, a, a loved wife and an unloved wife, and the unloved wife has the firstborn son, but because you don't love her, you give the inheritance to the son of the loved wife. You are causing a pollution in the land, I think. It doesn't say that in those texts, but I'm going to imply it because it's sort of in this whole passage. And this whole idea of pollution is part of the uh, concept of this chapter. So I put in the notes, by nature sin is defiling. It is like swimming in a cesspool. The nature of sin is that it pollutes a life and it pollutes a land. There's, there's a sense people say, oh, well, you know, as long as it just hurts me, it doesn't matter, I can do what I want. No, that's not true. A sin does hurt you, that's true. But sin has a contaminating effect. It has an effect of, of, uh, that, that it actually brings a reproach to people who are related to you, to your whole family, to uh, people you're connected with. And they'll say, oh yeah, they, they had that guy there. Oh, he was a part of that church. You have a scandal in a church that becomes very public, and people in town say, oh yeah, that church, yeah, they had that guy, right? Well, it's usually always a guy, but sometimes it's a woman. Oh, that woman went there, right? Okay. So there is a polluting effect to sin. And God, in the concept of Israel, God was giving them this land. It was God's land, the picture is that God owns the land. When you are sinning in the land, you're causing pollution in the land. The same is the idea behind the Day of Atonement. The whole idea of the Day of Atonement is that every year there are sins that you have not dealt with, that you have not overcome. You're not brought in sacrifice. You haven't, maybe there was somebody that was murdered and they didn't do this little ritual over them. Maybe there's some of these other sins that polluted the land. So over the year, the land gets more and more polluted as people in Israel sin. So on the Day of Atonement, the whole ritual of the Day of Atonement is to cleanse the land. And the reason you cleanse the land is if you don't do this, God will not hear you. And so the pollution of sin becomes a barrier between you and God. So the Day of Atonement makes it possible for you to have access to God, for God to hear your prayers, for God to uh, accept your sacrifices, for God to receive you. So that is the picture for the Old Testament Israelite. But here's the picture for the New Testament Christian. Uh, sin 
contaminates ourselves, it contaminates others, and it puts a barrier between us and God. And so, obviously, we if you're born again, you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven, but there is such a thing as being out of fellowship with God. There is such a thing as a barrier between you and God. It, in um, I always forget if it's first or second Peter, somebody will correct me, but it's where it talks about the the uh, uh, that the, the husband needs to treat his wife properly, otherwise, so that his prayers not be hindered. Right? Why is that? Because he's polluted if he's not treating her properly. And his prayers are hindered. The same thing is true for all of us. We look at First John and he calls on us uh, not to deny that we have sin, not to be arrogant and proud and so forth. And then he says, and if we sin... We are to confess our sins to the Lord. I'm messing up my... I'm not quoting it right. I think it started right. Uh, and he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So this idea of pollution is behind these laws, behind what happens when we have sin. We, you know, we come here in prayer meeting, but you know, we need to walk close to the Lord. When we sin, we need to make it right with those we've offended. We need to make it right with God because our lives... And even our church is polluted when we sin. That's the idea behind this text. And I hope it is an admonition to us to make us to help us to get on praying ground with God. All right, well, let's close with the word of prayer. If you have questions, we'd be glad to talk about it more after the service. Our Father, we thank you for this passage, and we do thank you for uh, the fact that we can have a relationship with you, that we can keep it clean and clear. Lord, I do pray that you would help each of us to walk faithfully with you to, to love you with all our hearts, to, uh, to uh, keep ourselves in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We pray these things in Jesus' name.